green flag at the back means it is time. Two, three, four, five red lights in Budapest. And the Hungarian Grand Prix is underway. Lando Norris chops across his teammate, but it's a good reaction time for Oscar Piastri. The two papaya cars go side by side with Piastri down to the inside. Verstappen trying to go the long way round. Piastri takes the lead of the race. Lando Norris in second. Verstappen off the road as he rejoins, having gone off all four wheels. Trying to take advantage and take second place is Lewis Hamilton. Verstappen funnels wide. Lewis Hamilton. Oscar Piastri leads. Lando Norris retakes third. Max has to give the position. We're on it. I was ahead of the apex and he's just up with the wheel for a good for himself. Understood, Max. Norris now, who'd already lost the place on the inside, he's exactly like Barcelona for him. Now he's got to look to the outside, and there comes Max steaming round the outside. Lando could have done the same thing to his teammate, technically, and just kept it pinned, used the runoff area like Max has done, but he was fairer in that example, backed off. Here's a chance for Sainz up against Fernando Alonso. These two have raced each other already this year. It got very rough in China, but that's a tidy move and an easy pass for the winner of the Australian Grand Prix. Max, the incident is under investigation. I think our recommendation is you let this go. We can talk about it later. Well, why can't they not just say what they think? And then we decide that's the... He's slowing down, he's slowing down, they will switch positions. And Lando Norris takes second place. Red Bull decide not to risk the penalty. Hamilton in, an eight-time winner of this Grand Prix. He's managed to keep pace with those ahead, and he's the first one of the top five to come in and change tyres. He goes from medium to hard on lap 17, and everyone now is going to be forced to respond. Let's see Max's stop. Not ideal. Three seconds for a team that are used to getting it around two seconds. In comes Sainz, one of our six different winners so far this year. He's on the hard tyre as well. Verstappen rejoins behind Piastri, behind Norris, and a switch for the current podium places. Hamilton steps onto what would be a net third place. Oh. Fighting oh. it into 11 off the road. Wow, wow, wow. Be cool, be cool, Oscar. That's what brought Lando Norris back into play. Here comes Verstappen, DRS wide open, wasn't able to shape for the move before. Is he laid on the brakes? He is, Hamilton covers it off, but locks up doing so. Will that open the door for Verstappen? Are they going to go wheel to wheel once again? Hamilton on the left-hand side, Verstappen trying to sweep around the outside and take the place. He goes off the road, he can't slow it down, and it's Hamilton staying in third for the moment. A minus five great buys and it takes his chance of period. It's unbelievable. Hamilton again in early. Says so a long way to take the tyre, but he comes in and so does Charles Leclerc. Looking for the undercut on Verstappen. Unusual because he went longer in the first he stint, did. but they've just tried to catch Red Bull out with that sh very short second stint. Good stop from Ferrari, good stop from Mercedes as well. Very sensible on both. It's quite impressive how we let us have good undercut in this completely race. Lando Norris will be the McLaren that gets the fresh tyres first. Can he undercut Piastri from here? Two that, seconds. That's the question, isn't it? Can he get onto the fresher rubber? Can he put the pressure on that way? They chose to bring in their leader in the championship. OK, Oscar, Lando has pitted to cover Hamilton to make sure he covers Hamilton. We'll manage that situation. Best pace from you now. Best pace. Yeah, Sainz dives off into the pit lane as well, which will unleash Norris round the final corner. And I think Lando is going to lead the race. This is going to be a huge moment. Lando Norris goes past his teammate, and it's going to be the net lead of the Grand Prix. They told Piastri it was to cover off Hamilton. Is that the moment that has decided our winner today? Okay, Lando. Oscar has just pitted. We'd like to re-establish the order at your convenience. Oh, big moments into the gravel for Oscar Piastri. That is more than you want to be dipping the wheels. OK, Max Verstappen comes into the pits to finish this sequence of stops with massive consequences for who wins this Grand Prix and who's on the podium as well. Well, that's some gentle introduction. No, mate, don't give me the... Oh, you guys give me the strategy, OK? I'm trying to rescue myself. 
need you to save more tyres, please, and we do want to let Oscar through. Uh, we should have boxed him first then, surely, no? Doesn't matter. I mean, it does. To me, maybe. Game on for fourth place. Could be the final place on the podium. They're fighting on the racetrack once again. Max Verstappen to the apex first. And he's got the place from the Ferrari. He will go up against Lewis Hamilton next. One position gained as Verstappen tries to minimise the damage in the points in the World Championship and tries to climb back onto the podium. And I know we still think you're using the tires too much. Turn four, turn 11, and the rear's exit. Turn six, turn nine. Oscar's 3.5. I know you'll do the right thing. As uh, Verstappen, well, will he dive this time? This time he gets there. He locks up and he makes contact with his old rival. Verstappen and Hamilton come together again, battling for the final place on the podium. And they're into each other to drop Max Verstappen off the road down to fifth place. Yeah, up and breaking. I'm not even going to get into a radio fight with the other team as Max will let the shoes do their thing. It's childish on the radio. Childish. Uh, just move the steering, mate. Copy, mate. So that was for Stappen. He arrived out control to that one. The way to win a championship is not by yourself. It's with the team. You're going to need Oscar, and you're going to need the team. Mando Norris is backing off. He was on the cusp of a second Grand Prix victory. And it's a situation that DC knows from his career. A swap for positions. Oscar Piastri goes back through into the lead of a Grand Prix. The man from Melbourne leads. He was a champion in Formula 3, a champion in Formula 2. He announced himself in Formula 1 with a tweet that said he would not be driving for another team. It turned out that he would be driving for McLaren. And he's taking that McLaren to the top step of the podium. The Australian driver advances all the way to the checkered flag. Oscar Piastri wins for the first time in Formula 1. It's a McLaren 1-2. And the driver who grew up hearing V10 engines in his back garden because he lives so close to the track in Melbourne is now one of the winning group. As Lewis Hamilton claims, he's 200th podium in Formula One. Well done, Oscar. Well done. Check your flag. Well done, buddy. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much. Thanks for the coordination. Well done. Maximum points. Really good weekend. This is the Outlap F1 Podcast featuring America's own Cody, Andy, and Deanna. Your one-stop shop for Formula One news, insights, race previews, and reviews. Join us on the Outlap. What is up, Outlap F1 Nation? This is Season 6, Episode 26 of the Outlap F1 Podcast. It's our 2024 Hungarian GP race review show. You've got Andy, and I'm happy to say he is finally off of storm duty. He's been freed of his conscription. (laughs) Uh, I'm along with Cody tonight. It is great to see you again, sir. Uh, One, I'm glad you survived it. And two, uh, how you doing otherwise? Uh, otherwise I am doing fantastic. Had a really nice weekend. Got to see some family and friends, play some Dungeons and Dragons, but, uh, yeah, those, uh, those night shifts last week were, uh, pretty rough, but I'm, uh, I'm getting back to normal and, uh, got a good race on Sunday to, you know, help me forget about all of that. So we're, uh, we're doing good. Good to hear. So as I, I put a tweet out about this, uh, you know, Wednesday, Thursday, we weren't able to do a preview because in case you don't know, uh, and you can Google July 15th, Illinois derecho if you'd like to get proof of this, the Chicago area got absolutely nailed by this line of 50 mile line worth of storms that rolled through and the sirens went off everywhere, including downtown, which almost never happens. And I think at one point I thought I saw it was like 150,000 people in our area without power. And Cody's job is to help to fix that when that happens. And he got put on extended freaking storm duty. So thank you for doing God's work, number one. And two, 
my job is easy in this. I don't, I am fortunate enough that I'm not one of the guys who has to, to go outside and actually do the dirty work. So those are the guys who deserve all the credit. I just, I'm just helping. <laughs> well, we appreciate all of that. And it looked like finally, by the end of the weekend, it looked like all of that had finally gotten situated. So uh, we're glad to have you back and we're glad to have you on the show with us. So if you found our show, welcome along as David Croft, who was very quotable this weekend, and we'll probably talk a little bit about some of that too, would say, you can find our show on Twitter, Instagram, Discord, Reddit, and YouTube at Outlap F1 Podcast is the handle for all of that. You can see our link tree in our show notes or our descriptions or links that we put out. We take you to the link tree. That tells you where to find us all over the place. If you're on YouTube and you like what you're seeing and you enjoy what you're hearing, you can uh, do us a solid and smash that subscribe button, or you can click a like if you'd like to as well. And if you're on your favorite podcasting app, a five-star review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify would help us come up a little bit better in search results. We would appreciate that if you'd like to do that. You can email the show, chat now at outlapf1.com, takes you there. Thank you so much to the people who do support us monetarily, who enable us to do this lovely little enterprise. Uh, thank you so much to Dean Warwick, Yuri Dolchester, Paul Weaver, Quentin Warden, Kevin Kelly, Regan Stanzik, Timothy Brown, and of course, Jonathan Scott. If you'd like to become a member of that hashtag Outlap F1 Nation and have me say your name on every recording, if you'd want to give us a dollar, five dollars, it's all it takes. We will be most grateful for it and we would appreciate it if you'd like to do that. As a final reminder, the good folks at Manscaped continue to offer 20% off and free shipping with our code OUTLAP. That's O-U-T-L-A-P, all one word, if you'd like to peruse their various different products that are all really wonderful. All right. And before we actually get into the weekend, one thing, this is actually first recording since our big Giles Richards interview. Wanted to thank take a minute and thank Giles one more time. Thought it was an amazing discussion. He was easy to talk to, personable, attentive, reactive to our questions. He answered all of them more than thoroughly. You really couldn't have asked for a better guest. So I wanted to say thank you very much to him his publicist, Steph, who helped to put all this together despite all of the scheduling, ins and outs and ups and downs, and where is he going to be and where we're going to be. And, oh, yeah, there's five, you know, 2,500 miles between us. But he couldn't have been a nicer guest, and we hope to have him on again. I definitely want to take him up on that offer. But, uh, Cody, any final reaction to – it was a lot of work to put that together, but I thought it came out really good at the end. It, it was fantastic. If you haven't listened to it, please go listen to it. Tell your friends to go listen to it. We're very proud of it. Uh, as as Andy said, uh, Giles was very personable, uh, did a great job uh, discussing the book, answering uh, our questions. You can tell he is very, very passionate about Formula One and what he does. And uh, we're we're very grateful that he, uh, he gave us his time. And uh, uh, definitely go check out his book as well. Um, uh, yeah, go give the podcast a listen. And uh, he really gives some excellent insight into uh, the background and work of a lot of different people in uh, a Formula One team. So yes, please go give it a listen. And uh, we'd, we'd love to uh, uh, discuss Formula One with Giles again. Yeah, I'm going to try to get some short form content out as well over Instagram or little snippets of that interview if you don't want to consume the whole thing. But if you if you have time, it's like perfectly timed. It's about an hour. So for my commute going into the office, it like lands perfectly in and out and, you know, easy peasy. There you go. But uh, yeah, it was an amazing experience and we're really happy and proud of the work that we did there. All right, so now let's dive into the Hungaro Ring Grand, the Hungarian Grand Prix well, weekend. We will start with our headline of the day, Cody. I'll let you go first here, and then I'll chime in. But uh, what you got? All right, my headline is congratulations, McLaren. You managed to make everyone angry about your one-two finish, and I don't think I've ever really come out of something like this where I was at the same time really happy for the team results and also felt so empty about it because yeah it just it was messy it was gross I think Oscar felt really weird about it I think Lando definitely felt very angry about it uh the team didn't really know how to handle it and yeah I think we came out of this with Oscar Piastri's first Formula One victory which everyone should be 
very happy about, including him. And he even sounded a little muted uh, when it came to his post-race uh, interviews and his radio. It's just, it's weird. And I wish I could feel better about it. Yeah, I, I'm a, I'm right there with you. <laughs> uh, my, I, I got two headlines. I've got the headline that we should have. And the headline that we should have is, what a bounce back for that team after a tough weekend in Great Britain where they put their heads down and absolutely dominated a, a weekend for the first time in a really long time. You know, they had the one, two in Monza a couple years ago. That was kind of helped by a couple of the combatants kind of sort of um, taking themselves out. This was on pure pace. So needless to say on that front, I'm excited and happy and over the moon but instead of that being the main headline, instead we get, and I hope I do this right, emotional damage. The hot temps and the twisty corners of the Hungaro ring certainly tested the wits of the participants and those watching them too. Wow. We're going to get into all that. There are other stories that we will unpack throughout the course of the rest of the weekend. Uh, as you can tell where I'm going, uh, I made sure I ate the spicy salsa before I got on tonight, just so I'm in the right mindset. <laughs> so here we go. So we will start, as we are always apt to do, with the qualifying session, which was actually, for my particular uh, fandom, was really good. But So lining up in P20, boy. It seems like they've gone back to prior form. This did not look good. Uh, that was the Alpines. Uh, Pierre Gasly in P20. Esteban Ocon in P19. Wow. Uh, P18 was Zhao Grand Yu. P17 was George Russell. Big story out in Q1. Mercedes dropping a ball. These were tricky, changeable conditions in the qualifying, as we'll talk about. P16, the other big shocker. Maybe it's not a shocker anymore. Sergio Perez also getting out qualified by Logan Sargent. For the seventh time this season, P15 was Kevin Magnuson. P14 was the aforementioned Logan Sargent. P13 was Alex Albon, and P12 was Valtteri Bottas. P11 was Nico Hulkenberg. Advancing through to the Q3 shootout from 10 to 1, P10 saw Yuki Tsunoda. P10, P9 saw Daniel Ricciardo. Uh, both B-carbs bouncing back a bit here. P8 was Lance Stroll. P7, Fernando Alonso. P6 was Charles Leclerc. P5 was Lewis Hamilton. P4 was Carlos Sainz. P3 was Max Verstappen. P2 was Oscar Piastri, and it was a McLaren 1-2 front row lockout, uh, with P1 being Lando Norris and the other McLaren. McLaren's first front row lockout since Brazil in 2012. All right, Cody. Big thoughts on the qualifying and all those weird... All of a sudden, we got a rain shower that nobody expected. Uh, we didn't do a weather preview. I didn't have weather in the forecast at all for that. It was supposed to be completely sunny with like 12% rain. And then, blam, big shower right before kind of messed everybody up. But not enough to put on intermediates. But what was your thought? Oh, let's see here. Starting with Red Bull. I don't really think there's much else to say about Sergio Perez. We feel like a broken record here. Uh, and crashed crashed in qualifying again uh, managed to put her in a lap good enough by then for 16th but i mean man it's not good <laughs> i am thinking fairly strongly at this point that he's going to get swapped with somebody after the summer break no matter how much he denies it um also pretty surprising max verstappen not on the front row despite getting significant upgrades to his red bull and only his red bull uh, a lot of body changes uh, it looked in my opinion, a lot more like last year's car uh, with the, the bodywork changes. And I guess they had new floor work uh, done for this weekend. And going into qualifying, I thought that uh, the Red Bull would be pretty dominant considering the upgrade, but it was not the case. Um, Max Verstappen was you know, almost a half second off of Oscar Piastri in second. And, you know, more than that behind Lando. So uh, the McLarens definitely looked like a dominant force all weekend here. And here's one where I will actually give the MCL boys some credit uh, for making an audible, especially in Q3, because Lando only had one set of soft tires. He had to use his second 
uh, what normally would have been his Q3 second set to get out of Q1 because the track was drying and then another rain shower would hit. And it was all, where were you, right? Well, you were trying to literally go in between the raindrops there. And everybody, the track suddenly gripped up really bad after the Perez crash. It dried out because the rain had stopped and that allowed the track to dry out. And then it started yielding all this grip and everybody was setting personal best time. So you had to be out there uh, in order to not get caught out at the end. So Lando burns a set of, you know, and George Russell too. And it didn't work for George Russell at all because uh, he doesn't make it out of Q1, but Lando manages to survive it. I think he managed in Q1 and P13. And I think Daniel Ricciardo was actually the fastest time in Q1. So let that just kind of tell you how much the track was evolving there. Uh, so we get to Q3. It, rain is supposed to come in about maybe four minutes time. I never heard the radio transmission, but I saw it on the McLaren um, scroll that they do on their uh, website where they can kind of give you the cons. And they said, you know, rain in four minutes and Lando goes, well, let's go. And they swapped. They were going to send him out on the used tires to do the first run. Then all of a sudden he's out there on the new set and he, ha he had one lap to get it done. This time he gets it done. 115.227. Holds off Oscar Piastri by not much. I mean, we're talking two hundredths, which is not a lot of time. Uh, I've seen the comparisons, the overlays of their lap time. It is incredibly close. And Max couldn't, in spite of the fact he had two runs at it, couldn't quite get it done. And we saw really, I think, the first time this season, Max get really, really not happy. This was no longer happy Max. So there was this oddity because as the, the second runs are ending, the track is now drying out again. And I think it's Yuki Sonoda has the big crash. So Sonoda goes off, has a big crash. There's like two minutes, 15 seconds on the clock. Technically, the session can't be end at that point. So even though everybody had you gone through their second sets of new tires, those who had two sets, there was still potentially a, ch a chance to go out and try to set another lap. Many guys went out at least again to cover somebody off to see what would happen. Max did not. He got out of the car. He went to the FIA Waybridge, weighed himself, took his helmet, and kind of said, well, that's kind of it. And that seemed to be a little harbinger of things to come. So I thought that was kind of interesting. Now, in practical terms, I don't think anybody went faster. The in fact, the only guy who went faster in all that was Daniel Ricciardo. Uh, who actually moves up to P9 because of that. So maybe this is much ado about nothing, but I thought that was interesting. Why not at least go and try or get grip or something? But Cody, any thoughts on that? Uh, well, first thing I would like to uh, slightly amend my previous statement. It was not a half second difference between Max and the McLarens. I totally misread our notes. It was much closer than that. So maybe I wouldn't say McLaren dominance, but McLaren definitely had the leg up. So... Uh, my apologies for that, but as yeah, as far as uh, the craziness with the the little bit of wet weather there, um, I, I did like that it, it threw a little bit of wrench uh, a wrench into things. It was kind of fun seeing Daniel Ricardo at the uh, the top of the the timing page, and I'm sure you're going to hear all kinds of pundits you know pointing to that and saying, "Oh, does that mean he's ready for the Red Bull seat? <laughs> Is Perez done?" And I'm not sure it's it's quite enough evidence for that, but. It was so cool to see. No, I mean, it was great for, for Danny. and It was great for Yuki. I mean, V-Carb, which had been not on it the last couple of weekends, getting back on it and kind of back into their now kind of understanding their upgrade package. A lot of teams brought lots of big upgrade packages here. Uh, so that was kind of interesting to see as well. One team that we kind of got to talk about that normally is the king of execution and who kind of really dropped the ball. What the hell happened with Mercedes? I mean, they didn't fuel George Russell enough to finish the lap, even though the track was gripping up. So he goes out, he sets two flying laps. They were decent for what the track was. And then the track dried out. And by the time George realized what was up, it was way too late. They couldn't do anything. And Lewis Hamilton gets into Q3 and finishes P5, but just barely. I think it was like one hundredth of a second in Q2. So even though these teams are... are even the ones that execute really, really well, it's such on the margins. It's so tight. The pressure seems to be on just about everybody up and down the grid. Yeah, I'm, I'm very excited that everything has closed up so much <clears throat> that we're, we're we're getting such a close fight, even in qualifying between you know all of those top five teams. A spa is going to be amazing. I, the spa qualifying is going to be appointment television for 
sure. All right, so we will leave the qualifying there. We will now flip over and we'll get into the Sunday race, and we shall start with the back markers and build into the podium, which is where I think we're going to spend a lot of time just because that's kind of where the stories were. But uh, getting through the back markers, boy, can this guy catch a break. My God, this is like the third race in a row. They keep changing engine components and keep putting Pierre Gasly at the back, and it's not helping. I don't get it. He DNFs again. Not classified. Pierre Gasly retired. At least he saw the start this time, so that was something. But on lap 33, he goes no farther. He gets the dreaded DNF. P19, Zhao Granyu in the kick Sauber. P18, Esteban Ocon. Uh, just rounding out, a, I think, a, just an overall painful weekend for the Alpine team. P17 was Logan Sargent. P16, Valtteri Bottas. P15, Kevin Magnussen, P14, Alex Albon, and P13 was Nico Hulkenberg. Uh, Haas seemed to regress a little bit this weekend, too, not doing the, not showing as good a form as they had some other places. I'm wondering if this is more track-specific, weather-specific, or something like that for them. But, Cody, any big thoughts here in the back markers? Uh, not a whole lot of mobility between uh, the back markers here. A lot of... Uh, a lot of these guys finished fairly close to where they started the race. Um, in fact, mobility uh, for on-track passes was pretty slim throughout the whole weekend up and down the grid. Uh, it seemed like really the best place for on-track passes was was at the end of that uh, front straight. And beyond that, it was really hard to make a pass uh, as, as we're going to get into it a little bit here. We saw some guys, cough, cough, Max Verstappen, uh, being really aggressive uh, throughout the entire lap and just it couldn't couldn't make it happen but yeah uh, we definitely saw uh, a pretty poor weekend from Alpine uh, some of it you know out or a lot of it probably outside of the driver's controls there but uh, yeah really rough one for Pierre Gasly uh, Logan Sargent not able to finish in front of Perez in the race unfortunately <laughs> um, but yeah, we didn't really even see a whole lot of these guys during the broadcast. It was kind of a, a race that was more focused, focused, more focused at the front again, um, and more focused on drama than I would say on on track action. Really, yeah, I, I, we'll get we'll get we'll unpack a lot of that in just a little <laughs> bit. I'm I'm building up to it. So anyway, <laughs> uh, we'll then move into the midfield, and the midfield saw in P12, that was Daniel Ricciardo, P11, Fernando Alonso, P10, Lance Stroll in the Aston Martin, P9, there he is again, my boy, Yuki Tsunoda coming home in the points yet again, uh, P8, the recovery drive, fairly decent recovery drive, I would say, for these two. George Russell in the Mercedes comes home in the points solidly in P8, and P7, at least he made the best out of possibly his Sunday. Uh, that was Sergio Perez in the Red Bull. So I think it's the first time he scored points in the last two rounds. So good for him there. Uh, P6 was Carlos Sainz. P5, we shall talk about the trials and tribulations of one Max Verstappen this weekend. P4, probably the quietest P4 that I could remember for a long time. Uh, Charles Leclerc in the Ferrari. I don't think he was even on camera once the entire race, but... Uh, Ferrari is not, not bad, not great, not where they want to be, obviously, but not bad. But all right, Cody, I'll let you take it. Thoughts in the midfield here. Let's see here. I'm sure Charles Leclerc is happy that this was a quiet weekend because P4 is much improved form for him compared to the last few races. We've been joking for a while now that he used up all of his luck for the season for that Monaco victory. So even though he didn't make it to the podium this time, fourth is really good. Um, it shows a, a return to form for him. Uh, some of that luck coming back. Um, yeah, Max Verstappen. Uh, this one's going to be probably the big one from the midfield to talk about here. And, you know, kind of surprising that Max is in the midfield to begin with, despite the car upgrades. Uh, he was, I guess you could argue, having the strategy screwed a little bit. At least that's how he argued it was that he was getting his strategy screwed up by the team. We saw throughout this race that the undercut was pretty powerful. And Max was, for one thing, with the strategy, not happy that he seemed to continue to be undercut by other drivers. I believe in the first round of pit stops, I'm trying to remember this all, I believe on the first round of pit stops, he got undercut. It was, and then it he was, got undercut it was, by... It was Lewis and Leclerc. 
And then on the second one, I know for sure it was Lewis. Yeah. So he's getting repeatedly undercut here, which means that he's got to do the on-track work of reclaiming those positions with, you know, slightly fresher tires. And as I discussed uh, for the back markers, it really wasn't easy to make the on-track passes here. And despite the upgrades, that Red Bull hasn't really made any gains in dominance. So even getting past, you know, Right now, the Ferraris and the Mercedes is a real tough ask. And he was getting progressively more and more aggravated throughout the race, uh, starting with the strategy and then with having the car not behave the way he wanted to. Uh, there was a lot of complaints about uh, not being able to turn the car too much understeer, uh, despite having the brake bias as far back on the car as he could do it. Um, being too aggressive on the tires after a pit stop which uh, his uh, race engineer uh, GP was commenting on, which gave us a a great little bit of radio uh, commentary for Max, which pretty much resulted in a don't give me that shit. (laughs) Um, In fact, there was a whole bunch of uh, radio gems from Max this weekend. A lot of it couldn't be broadcast, apparently, because there was was a lot lot of sailor sailor words in there. Woo! Um, And my my favorite of which uh, came near the end of the race when he was trying to make a move on Lewis Hamilton, which of course that that's going to bring back uh, flashbacks for everybody. Max making a move on Lewis and it actually looked familiar too. He was getting frustrated on making that move past Lewis to get the last podium position. He made what was in my opinion, a very, very overly aggressive move up the inside going into the first turn on Lewis Locked up the car, uh, was skidding past Lewis. Lewis has to turn the car at some point in order to make the turn. And from what I could see in the replays, he waited. He eventually had to make the turn. He clips uh, Max's back wheel, and we get some serious air out of Max's car. He was very fortunate that his car wasn't toast on the spot. He managed to still bring it home and finish the race in fifth, which... After that incident, I would say it was a win for him. But um, yeah, he was just way in the wrong on that one. I mean, we've, we've seen it before. I'm a Max fan. I wore the hat. Couldn't bring myself to wear the hat this one, even if McLaren didn't get the one too. <laughs> um, he tries to make the argument that Lewis moved under braking and even his race engineer GP was like, I'm not going to argue <laughs> about this with the other teams, man. You're being childish. Uh, and I, I loved that he even said that on the radio. Basically, the equivalent of knock knock that crap off is pretty much what I got over it. But, I mean, you know, the, the move – and compare this to Austria with Lando, where it was the slightest touching, and both of them get punctures. And here, Max's front wing digs into the ground. The rear wing goes flying up. The car comes crashing down, and he's fine. He literally turns around in turn one and goes on his way and he's at race pace. I, I don't get it. Like some, there are places when these F1 cars where apparently you can really take a lick and keep on ticking and there's other ones. And Lewis was fine too. Like even if Lewis had some front wing damage, I don't think it ended up mattering in the end. But, mm-hmm. you know, and then, and then there's other places where if you just hit him in the wrong spot, it's instant game over. You know, if you hit one of these cars in the rear diffuser, it knocks off half the downforce or, you know, we, we've heard this before. 18, 19 points of downforce lost, two, three tenths a lap. That's your game over. You got no chance to win if that's the case. But the other thing that I could not believe is that incident with Lewis, which universal. I, I've, I've watched. I know where you're going. It's universal that everybody said that that was Max's fault. Martin Brundle called it. I watched the other broadcast on F1 TV. David Coulthard called it. Stewards. Hello, stewards. How in the name of God does that not get a penalty post-race after that? I I don't know. I I, I, I just, that was, I'm just, I, I got nothing for that one because that's definitely the, the, textbook definition of causing a collision and then go back to the first lap where he does the, Oh, I'm just going to go off the track and try to gain the advantage and let somebody tell me that I'm wrong. 
And the team had to tell him, Max, you got to give that position back. It's being investigated. Now, I would have loved to have seen what the stewards would have done or not done because I think Max has a point because if he gets away with that, what, what anybody, you know, hello, was was the mic on in the stewarding room? I don't get it. I do not understand it. Yeah, I, I totally agree with you that Max deserved a penalty for that and was also pretty flabbergasted that he didn't get it because I was I was discussing the race results with some friends and I literally got to talking about what he did and that I thought he was going to probably get a post-race penalty in the form of you know, a grid penalty for the next race or something. And I'm literally discussing with them. I pull it up on my phone and I'm like, and he got nothing. <laughs> I, I don't get it either. I, I really felt that that one was pretty clear as day that that was reckless and 100% his fault. And yeah, the fact that he didn't get assessed any penalty for that is just, he's going to keep doing it. It's going to be like the Breaking Bad meme. He can't keep getting away with this. Right. Yeah. I mean, exactly. I mean, it was, I go back to what Andrea Stella said after Austria. You know, if you don't discipline it here, he's going to do it again. And I, I, we got what, you know, however many rounds we got left to go. We got, you know, 11 rounds left. We're going to see this again. We're going to do this song and dance again. It's not new. He's the same guy he's always been. There's two There's two of him. There's the calm and cool a Max Verstappen wins by 30 seconds guy. And then there's this guy. And they both exist one end in the same and can come out at the same time. Um, it's just, you know, for a guy that's got that much talent, he did not have to do that. You know, at some point you, you just got to realize, and, and granted, he's so far up in the drivers, even with this, it, it probably isn't going to matter in the long run. And when we get to the podium, that's going to be a talking point of what actually matters in that and what doesn't. But Ay, ay, ay. It was just like, you know, here we go again, you know, and again, it's with Lewis. I don't know what it is about those two, but when they get together, it is. And, and Lewis didn't do a damn thing wrong. There was no aggression on the Lewis side of this whatsoever. And it was it was weird because I think Lewis was trying to, to lap. I think it was Albon. So both of them had DRS and how Max thought he was going to get that car stopped after flying in like that is just beyond me. But, you know, and anyway, well, whatever. Uh, you know, stewards, hello. <laughs> Anytime would be nice. <laughs> but, all right, let's get into the podium. That podium saw P3 being Lewis Hamilton. P2 and P1 is where all the controversy in this race lies. Between the McLaren uh, duo, uh, P2 was Lando Norris, and P1, he does get his first race victory. Let's not besmirch that. Uh, Oscar Piastri in the McLaren this is definitely a well-deserved victory. I just wish everybody, including myself, could have enjoyed it more. First, the start. Let's talk about the start. I think that's kind of, we have to kind of get into the start. I'll kind of tell you where I'm thinking. So it it was definitely another one of those, like, I, I the Lando and the start thing. <laughs> yeah, I, can, I can feel the, the it, it's bubbles coming. coming yes, up It's here. coming. The Lando and the start thing is now a thing. Because I don't know what else he could have done right here. He definitely nails the launch. And yet again, he tries the move. He did this in Spain when he was on the pole, where he tries to cut off P2. And in so doing, he lets the guy in third come around the outside. And if he just holds the damn line, I don't think we're talking about anything that we're talking about. Instead, he was so trying to cut off Oscar that him and Max got together. And there's this there's this shot. The onboard is fascinating where you see Oscar on the right and Max on the left. And Lando literally has nowhere to go. It is. A, it's actually amazing. The three of them did not crash out in the first mm -hmm. 50, you know, 500 meters of this race. Uh, so tremendous car control by, by, believe it or not, by all three of them. Oscar, Lando and Max, even though Max was careening off uh, the off the track. Fine. <laughs> But still, the fact that that didn't end in complete tears for everybody involved is kind of amazing. So Lando's now down to P3. They, they get on the radio. They get on the horn immediately to tell Max to give the position back. He eventually does. Now he's pissed. Matt, now Lando's in P2. And we get through the first kind of half of the race. Oscar's got a nice four-second lead. Lando's in P2. Max uh, 
was in DRS range of Lando early for a little bit, but then Lando manages to wiggle his way out of that with some nice pace uh, that they ended up using, and they get through it. And, you know, the next thing you know, where they're like six seconds ahead of Max. They get through the first yeah. pits. Oh, go ahead. I was just going to say, it looked like it was going to be a pretty boring race there. And I'm sure Oscar would have loved for it to have been a completely boring race to uh, to get to his first victory. He got a great launch off the start, took the lead right out of the gate, opened up a little bit of a gap. He did have a couple moments here and there where he, you know, took a little bit of uh, dips into the gravel. That's true. Um, where that gap to Norris closed up a little bit. And in my opinion, that actually may have indirectly led to some of the controversy that happened because I think had Piastri kept the gap to Norris that he had up until those minor mistakes, which closed the gap to about like a second and a half at one yeah. point, I think he right around the first pit stops. So it was, you know, get close to two seconds again, but I think had that not happened, the gap would have been big enough that none of the stuff that transpired, you know, maybe it wouldn't have happened, but, uh, Either way, still had the lead, still was doing a great job. And then, yeah, like you say, we get to first round of pit stops and uh, they pit Norris first. And as we discussed earlier, the undercut here was very strong. Pit Norris first and the first round of pit stops didn't end up being a big deal. I believe right. it was the second it was round the second of pit one. stops where it really became an issue. Yeah, so so we get to the, through the first pit stop cycle, and everybody effectively kind of holds position is where they are. You've got Oscar in P1 with a comfortable, as you said, like four, four and a half second lead. Um, we get to right around the end of that second stint where the hard tire, now everyone was on hard tires at this point. This is where they start to to drop off, and everyone's reporting, you know, higher deg on the harder tires. So anybody who thought of a one-stop, that's out the window at this point. It's definitely a two-stop race. So we get to the point where now Oscar goes off in turn 11. And that, as you correctly said, takes the nice four and a half second gap and kind of shrinks it down to about a second and a half. And at one point, it gets down to 1.2. On Lando's radio, they come over and say, look, you can race him, but please note, we got to get the tire to, I think it's mid 40, you know, lap 45 ish. In the meantime, Lewis, who had stopped first in the first cycle, now stops again, and it's important to note where he was relative to – actually, Max was behind Lewis at this point. What? So it's important to know where Lando was relative to Lewis. It was eight seconds. That was the gap when Lewis, is, when Lewis pits. Now, you're right. The undercut is very powerful, but the undercut is also fleeting. You know, you can run two or three awesome laps when you come out of the pits on those fresh t- new tires, but that end of your stint – you're gonna be you're gonna be wishing you hadn't done that. And Lewis came out and ran two blistering, you know, first couple of laps. And I don't know. Here, here's where it gets weird because they instead of the normal the normal procedure would be if you're the lead car in this case you're Oscar you should have the preferred strategy. That's rule 101. That's pit strategy 101. No one would deny that. What McLaren, again, chose to do here was they were going to say, well, we're kind of worried about Lewis hard charging. We want to make sure we have the one-two. Why don't we just cover Lewis off, make sure that that's done. We'll put Lando out there. We don't even necessarily know that Lando's going to be able to undercut Oscar, but it was clear that that was going to happen once they went down this path. They hit Lando. He comes out. He's on fresh tires. He puts in a blistering first lap on those new tires, as any race car driver anywhere would have done. And then they pit Oscar, you know, and both stops were fine. There was no, you know, preference on the stops. They both went under the same set well, they of had, tires. They had Oscar go around for another lap, right. too, before pitting him. Right. Which was just even more putting Lando into the lead at that point. Yeah, I mean, and, and but they kept telling Oscar, don't worry about Lando, we're going to fix it after the pit stop. And oh. and all I'm th- sitting there thinking, and I'm going, what? Cover Lewis? Why? 
you, you guys are clearly faster. You've been the dominant car all weekend. The Mercedes, as good as they've been the last two weekends out, they didn't have that type of pace here. What the hell are you worried about Lewis Hamilton's race for? There's nothing there. And even if somehow Lewis gets in front of Lando, you've got Lando Norris, one of the best guys at figuring out how to do an overtake in the, in the game right now. I would put Max, Lewis, Lando, one, two, three, in that order in terms of the guys who, if you need an overtake done, call one of them because they'll figure it out. So why are you even doing that? Why does it even come into play? So now... Here's that. Now, of course, Lando goes screaming into the lead. He's like three and a half seconds up after the pit stop. And now they're trying to tell him, now you got to swap around. And if and now, now we have all this existential quandary coming into it that doesn't have to happen. And we end up going through, I think, about 20 laps of McLaren almost begging Lando Norris to slow down. And Lando really not saying anything. And it gets to the point where, <laughs> like, his yep. race engineer was almost like, dude, I'm just trying to protect you here. Come on. You got to do it. But oh, yeah, yeah. I would say it, it was begging at, at some points. It was, think of the team. You can't do this alone. Think of Oscar. You're going to need us all on your side for winning a championship. It was kind of sad. I think the team realized that they had uh, made a bit of an oopsie. Um, <laughs> and to be fair here, I think Oscar definitely deserved the victory here. Um, he was leading through through those whole first two stints, and he got the lead off the line. And as you said, being the lead driver should have had the preferred strategy. And I think McLaren had the gap uh, to Hamilton to still give Piastri the preferred strategy. They were being too cautious. And so you get in this weird spot where McLaren clearly feels that Oscar Piastri deserves the win. And they don't want to take that away from him because not only does he deserve the win, but it would be his first win. So there's even more incentive to not ruin that for him. But... I can't really fault Lando too much either because he didn't make any of those decisions that he pit when McLaren told him to pit. He ended up putting in some really good laps, got out in front of Piastri, got in that good clean air. And, you know, maybe he was just having a little bit of better luck, you know, with the lighter fuel and that last stint, but he was starting to open up the gap to Piastri. And I think at that point, Lando starts to think, Hey, I've only got one win to my name. I'm second place in the points, and now I'm opening up the gap. So I think I've got uh, some pretty good you know, ground to stand on here that I deserve this win too. Don't take it away from me. And he, he said on the radio, he's like, well, yeah, you know, if he wants to, if he wants to take the place back, he's got to catch up to me. Uh, and we didn't see that happening. You know, the team kept telling Oscar, yeah, we're working on it. We're going to get you guys the place back. And Piastri's like, this is going to get harder the further we get into the race. And then finally, with just a couple laps left, we get this really awkward situation where Lando pretty much stands on the brakes. <laughs> on that In the middle track. of the straightaway. Yeah, for a painful amount of time to let Piastri back past. Uh, and you know, we get to the end of the race and, and no one seems to be happy with this. Lando feels like he's been screwed. Oscar feels like a lot of the joy from his first win appears to have been taken out of it because he is, you know, the team was congratulating him on the radio, like first win, man, like this is so great. Congratulations. He's like, yeah, thanks guys. Uh, <laughs> no, no. It's just like, you could tell it wasn't what he wanted it to be. I think he wanted what he should have had, which is lead the whole race, show that he had what it take to control this and, and come out with the win. And that's, that's really what he deserved. And I, I feel very bad for him that he had that part robbed. Completely agree. Completely agree. And if you're Lando, I found a bit of sound that I think kind of sums up Lando's argument here. Let's see if I can actually play this on time. But you did not hear my words. And now it's come to this 
I think that that describes it. Like if you're, my God, how did we get here? It's like they they were so worried about potentially botching it from a guy who was eight seconds clear. Eight seconds in F1 terms is an eternity. It's an entire straightaway and a corner in Hungary. You could have dropped your 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 gun and picked it back up and still finished the pit stop and been fine. There is absolutely no reason to do that. And I've been sitting here. It's been uh, almost a good 36 hours since the race ended. And I have been in this kind of positional quandary as a fan. And, and this, I, I, I feel all weird. And this should have been a crowning achievement for that team. This is McLaren International. And God dang it, why can't they act like it? I'm not looking for Ron Dennis here, but act like you've been here before and know what the hell you're going to do. Good Lord. But not only that, but if you're Oscar, of course you're going to not be as excited as you would. He should have had the, oh, you know, F yeah moment. And, and maybe that's some of his just his personality. I do think he's – I equated him. I, I think I said in one of the chats I was in after the race, I, I feel like that guy's either an astronaut, an ER doctor, or like a fighter pilot or something like that. He just has that never-get-upset mentality. And like the most mm-hmm. exasperated he got on the radio, in spite of all the other side, because I had both of them going, was that one message. That was the only message he sent to the team about this whole thing, where he goes, hey, you know, if we let this go any longer, this is going to get really awkward. And the final argument that finally convinced Lando was the safety car argument. And that's even Lando said, now, in the post-race, Lando all said, look, I was going to do it. He wanted to do it on the last lap in the last corner to kind of make a point. It, it, the whole thing. I'm the, glad he didn't do that. No, so am I. Because, because that would have been a worse. Right. The whole, way worse way. the whole thing was just so unnecessary. And you can't. Like it comes down to me. Here's where it comes down to me. I think that McLaren pit wall saw ghosts of what happened in the last race. They got spooked that Lewis was going to do one of those last stint magic tire things like he did in Great Britain and somehow managed to eke out tire life that nobody else had, which is what he did in Great Britain. And he should be commended and praised for that drive. That was a great drive of his. But you can't be seeing ghosts. When all of the data that you have this entire weekend tells you that's not going to happen. Absolutely. Like, I should be ecstatic right now. Why am I frustrated? Why, why was the emotion that I had at the end of this race relief more than anything else? Yeah, you know, you know, something has gone horribly wrong when Andy is uh, venting and ranting about a McLaren. A one-two! Their most dominant one-two in 12 years! Oh, my God. <laughs> I knew I was going to get here. I knew I was going to get here. But anyway, that's that's my thought on it. Do um, you have anything else? I, I feel like I'm bad. I don't want to monopolize it. But do you have any other thoughts on it? Uh, well, uh, Lewis finished on the podium. That was cool. Uh, <laughs> Two, 200th um, podium for Lewis, by the way. Yeah. Yeah. Let's which not is forget that. Uh, the incredible achievement for him. Um, and... I'm sure he probably felt a little awkward being up on the podium once he saw what happened with those guys. But uh, he, yeah, you know, just my last touches on the McLaren thing. I think part of it is probably that it's been a long time since McLaren has had the strongest car. I mean, it, it, we weren't even really sure that they had the strongest right. car until it started happening week after week over the past, you know, now probably like five ish races. And now we're like confidently saying, okay, McLaren looks like they've got the strongest car now, but I can tell you in the entire time that I have been following formula one, not even like at the levels of fan that I am now, you know, even up to a few years before I went to the first race with you, They've sucked pretty bad. (laughs) And I think it's just, it's been so long and there's been a lot of turnover in the team. I'm probably, I'm sure in that time that they're probably just not used to being in that position and they don't want to 
risk it. Like you said, they, they've got this one, two, they don't want to lose it. It's been a long time since they've been in a position where they could get this on pure pace and not some little bit of luck like they had in 2021. And yeah, they're just they're being too cautious right now. They need to start acting like they can actually take the fight to Red Bull, but some faith in their drivers. They have one of the strongest driver lineups there is right now. They've got Oscar Piastri, who's well celebrated, uh, young talent, Formula Three champion, Formula Two champion, in his first year in Formula Two. You don't see that very often. And he's shown that he is really, really good in F one through, you know, his this is only his second season in the sport. So Oscar's great. And Lando has shown pretty much since he's been in Formula One that he is a top talent. And that has only come to be even more apparent over the past couple seasons. And this one especially, he got his first win. He got so many podiums last year during you know the domination of Max. Like you got you got guys who can handle it. I think you need to let them handle it. Thank you. That, that I really couldn't have said that any better because it's like, okay, even if they race each other, you can tell them to make no damage. You know, Mercedes in 2014 let Lewis and Nico go at each other. And they went at each other three, four, five times in Bahrain. And that was one of the most epic sequences of wheel-to-wheel racing that I have ever watched in my entire time watching this sport. And they raced each other clean. It was fair. It was a little offset on tires, but it was fine. And they both got through it and life went on and the world kept spinning and they got the 44 points that they were going to get anyway. It's okay to let these guys go. At, not They don't have to go at each other. It's not like, I don't think we were going to see wheel to wheel banging or anything like that, but there's no harm in allowing them to race. And it certainly makes everything look better. Like that the best guy at the end of the day, good, bad, or indifferent, actually won the thing. As opposed to, you know, now everybody's got questions. Lando's frustrated. He got to calm him down. And and the other side of it is what the hell happens if Lando didn't honor the team order and to try to be, you know, the 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 boss man and, and try to establish a dominant thing and all that. And what does that do to the dynamic? And, you know, Back in our Giles Richards interview, we all talked about Lando being this team guy, and he was all about trying to do right by the team, and that's what he wanted to do. And you felt him, like I felt him, leaning into that abyss and taking a good hard look. And I know you're a big Lord of the Rings guy, but he had the ring in his hand, and he was not daunting to chuck it into Mount Doom right there, man. That is a perfect (laughs) analogy. It, it was it was bright and it was shiny and it was calling his name, and at the last minute, now now the other thing is I thought of you and I are both the, the oldest and we've both had instances where our parents have told us to let the younger one win something. I'm sure it's happened, uh, yeah. and oh, yeah. I know how I've atta- I've done it, and I've done exactly what Lando did, where I'm like, well, yeah, I'm gonna do it, but I ain't gonna let anybody know I'm gonna do it. Till I do it, just so that you know who's still the bigger one around here. So that, that is all of that dynamic. But at the end of the day, it's all unnecessary. All of it, flat out unnecessary. But it's a great one too for the team. They, they yeah, we're gonna look at the constructors' points. The constructors' fight is on. Um, closest that it's been at this point of the season in a long time. So. Uh, there's that. <laughs> Why am I not happier? I should be so much happier. Wow. I'm, I'm surprised. I got I even felt like a little bit of the rant going here. <laughs> I mean, it's just, all right, we'll get, we'll cover This is going to dominate the conversation, obviously in the fan emails. We're going to talk about this some more when we get to awards. Um, I think I'm done for now. Uh, so we're going to take a break. We're going to re-rack. I'm going to calm down. I'm going to get all Zen again. And we're going to say where all those standings are in the drivers and the constructors. There are some changes there that we do need to talk about. We will then open it up to the fan email segment. I suspect this McLaren thing is going to be what dominates it. I've read them, and yes, it's going to. Um, So you'll want to come back, and we'll talk about all this from some different perspectives, which is all the main fun of the fan email segment. We'll hand out some awards. 
We won't do predictions because we didn't do any. It kind of got suspended due to weather. But then we'll set up our last uh, round before the end of the first official part of the season, before the summer break. Spot Frankershamps is beckoning. Uh, I actually can't wait for it. I mean, that this is going to be a fun weekend. Well, let's hopefully it's fun and not more of this. But anyway, we'll come on back. We'll get into all that in just a little bit. You are listening to the Outlap F1 podcast, and we'll be right back after this quick pit stop. Grab your flu powder, broomstick, or apparate to your favorite audio streaming service to join the discussion on Hogwarts, a podcast, where Dan and his friends have in-depth chapter-by-chapter breakdowns of each Harry Potter novel. Join the group as they dive into the magical world and discuss plot points, analyze character development, and occasionally go off the rails. Whether you're a muggle who's new to the series or a pure-blood wizard who won't need a remember-all, Hogwarts, a podcast, brings everyone to the Great Hall for a magical discussion. Hogwarts, a podcast, available wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome back in. This is Season 6, Episode 26 of the Outlap F1 Podcast. It's the 2024 Hungarian GP Review Show. You've got Andy, and I'm along with Cody tonight. We just wrapped up a dramatic uh, Hungarian Grand Prix, if nothing else. And so we're going to take a look at uh, where all the standings shake out after this round of the championship. Uh, Cody, if you want to take the drivers, I will chime in with the team standings. All right. After the Hungarian Grand Prix round, uh, Max Verstappen is still leading uh, driver standings, and he's still got a pretty good gap uh, over Lando Norris. Uh, Max Verstappen sitting at 265 points, while Lando Norris uh, picks up some points on Max this weekend. Uh, he's at 189. Charles Leclerc, also with some good points this weekend, uh, is in third place at 162. And his teammate Carlos Sainz is in fourth place with 154 uh, Oscar Piastri getting the big old 25 this weekend, and he, as we said, deserves it fully. Um, he is at 149 points, so uh, only a few points behind Carlos Sainz and Charles Leclerc now. Um, sixth place, Lewis Hamilton, with, with the, uh, the third place on the podium, is at 125, which now takes him past Sergio Perez, who is down in seventh place at 124 points. Uh, George Russell, I think pretty much scraping together w- w- whatever he could out of this weekend. Um, he is in eighth place with 116. And then you can tell that those top four <laughs> teams are uh, quite, a, quite a ways ahead of the rest because ninth and tenth currently is held by both Aston Martin drivers, and they are a pretty good gap back. So ninth place, we have Fernando Alonso uh, with 45 points. And then Lance Stroll in 10th with 24. Yeah, and that, that race for 10th continues to be ridiculously close with Sonoda's couple points. I think he's up now to 22, uh, so he's just shy of there. <laughs> and there's uh, Nico Hulkenberg is like on 19 or 22, something like that too. So uh, that race for 10th, uh, you're going to see some different names, I think, churn in and out of there depending on who's doing it. But uh, the Aston Martins currently hold that position. As for the team standings, Red Bull Racing Powertrains continue to lead. Uh, They are up to 389 points. Uh, P2 sees a new tenant in this spot. That is now McLaren Mercedes with their 1-2. They maximize their points on the weekend, uh, barring the fastest lap, uh, which went to George Russell, by the way, as it turned out. Um, They are up to 338 points, so we're almost within a Grand Prix point haul in P1 and P2 and the Constructors. Not quite, but getting there. P3 is Ferrari. They check in with 322 points. P4 is Mercedes. They are up to 241 points. Here's now the chasm. P5 is Aston Martin. Only 69 points. Compare that to P4. Wow. Uh, P6 is the V-Carb team. They check in with 33 points. P7, Haas, Ferrari. They score no points this weekend, so they remain on 27 points. P8 is Alpine. No luck for them this weekend at all. Uh, They remain on nine points. And P9, uh, that's where you find Williams. Uh, No points for them either. So they remain on four points. And P10, my gosh. 
Kick Sauber gets through the almost the entire first part of the season. The summer break can't happen soon enough for those poor poor guys, it seems. Uh, they remain zero points. All right, so you have heard our take. You've heard my sometimes exasperated take on all of the drama, the melodrama, the radio chatter back and forth. Uh, it was probably the most interesting, strange, out-of-body, almost fan experience I've ever had watching a race. Um, but we're going to get into the fan email segment, and we will start with Rachel Fleming. And I think Rachel and I are on the same wavelength here. Rachel was the first one to come in, by the way. So these are in the order that I got them. <laughs> Made sure I did that. So, Cody, take it away. It's your time to shine. What does Rachel have to say? All right. Rachel, thank you for your uh, your contribution. And she says, right, I am not happy. I should be happy. Uh, it was a brilliant race, but McLaren have absolutely ruined the day for Oscar. If they had pitted him first, none of this would have happened. Lando has every right to be mad. He had a six-second gap. Vettel in 2019 undercut Charles Leclerc in Singapore. Leclerc asked for the positions to be swapped and they refused. Why should Lando slow down? Oscar should have been faster. However, I'm not saying Oscar didn't deserve the win. He did. He was brilliant. But the way McLaren managed it was pretty disgraceful. Uh, But Red Bull will want to forget about this race very, very quickly. Perez put another nail in the coffin with another very expensive mistake. I think this is hurting the team now. But my God, Max was um, very poor as a leader of the team in this race. He sounded uh, like he needed his coffee this race. Oh, boy. I know where that's from. (laughs) And the final move on Lewis was um, awful, to be honest. And the team finally snapped and told him to stop being childish. Oh, and Gasly's car failed again. Uh, Why did I tweet that to you guys? Poor bloke. (laughs) Yeah, pretty much. I think was in full agreement with us on this one. Uh, We already uh, talked about the McLaren stuff at length. However, I do think it's very interesting that you, uh, you brought up the 2019 uh, race, which uh, ironically that ended up being Sebastian Vettel's last win in formula one. So for what it's worth, I'm happy that that one turned out the way that it did. Uh, But yeah, very good point that Vettel got the undercut there and they did not switch anything back, even though Charles had won, I think the last two races before that. So could have been on for three in a row at a time when uh, uh, Ferrari looked like they were on the comeback. But anyway, uh, yes, Perez is costing Red Bull a lot of money at the moment uh, in terms of damage to the car. And with the cost cap, you really, really don't want to do that. And with all of your P7, P8, and retirements lately. Yeah, really, really, really don't want to do that. Um, And yeah, my last bit on this is I totally agree with you. Max was not showing his best as a team leader here. We know that he is aggressive. uh, Just That's just the way he is. I think his personality is just that he uh, is is very passionate and uh, a very aggressive driver and Uh, is not afraid to show it. He's very, um, uh, I guess you could say doesn't mince his words very (laughs) blunt sometimes, but uh, I usually respect him for it. And I just think that this was taking it too far. I think he uh, was not playing nice with his team at all. And those are ultimately the guys that have your back. So, you know, they've, they've guided you to, you know, several driver's championships now, you know, you got to put your faith in them a little bit and, you know, let it go if it doesn't go your way every once in a while. Um, and uh, the, the part that Rachel says, uh, if anyone doesn't know about sounding like he needed his coffee, there's been some, some talk in the media that uh, perhaps Max was up too late playing I racing and that led him to be a, a, a bit of a, a grumpy guy <laughs> come Sunday. I personally doubt that that really had too much to do with it. But yeah, as it stands, he really uh, he really needs to step up and you know maybe uh, try to remember that we can all hear your radio messages and they don't <laughs> make you look good right now. So uh, maybe try to rein it in just a little bit. Yeah, that's. I mean, that's good advice. Um... I don't think the the up being up late thing had anything really to do. I mean, legitimately, 
these guys could probably still get in a nap if they really needed it. Um, they are very well looked after. They are well taken care of. They're, you know, from the nutrition and all that. And Max has done this before and it's never been an issue. And I don't think that this caused it. I think the car not being sublime and easy to drive and the fact that Max now has people in his sphere that are turning into slowly but surely opponents uh, adds pressure. And pressure, you are a different person when there is pressure applied. And we've seen the nice, cool, calm, collected, calculating, easy peasy, win the race as slow as possible, preserve the tire Max guy. That's part of him. Simply love him. Yes, exactly. That is part of him. There's also... The other guy that you've seen in the early part of his career, that's still a part of him, and he's still there. And it finally took 13 rounds plus 20-some rounds to really, really, truly bring that guy back out. And there you go. That's what you see. And he's got to figure out, like, now it's back on him. He's got to figure out what he's going to do mentally to prepare and to get better if he wants to get better. He may choose not to. He may he may be perfectly happy with how he wants to go about doing things. And it's going to be, you know, again, when the next time he's under pressure, how does he react? Do, do we have similar results to this? Does he, you know, somehow fight through it and come up with the goods when he needs to? We're going to see. I mean, that, the nice thing is, is now at least that's a question. Um, and, yeah. and, and Rachel, as to your McLaren point, I really couldn't have said it any better. Uh, <laughs> yeah, there was no reason to cover Lewis Hamilton there, box Oscar, and you're good. And you know what? And if the two guys have to go at it to actually settle the thing because one's quicker than the other, that's racing. That's what we're all here to do. Let it happen. Trust your guys mm-hmm. that they're that they will not wreck themselves. And and these guys that's have right. not shown throughout any of their their history that they're into wrecking each other. This isn't, you know, none of that. Like, I could see that if there had been an example of that happening. There hasn't been. So why, why even bother? Trust. It's okay. You could be McLaren International again. I, I give you permission. It's all right. <laughs> Definitely agreed. Thank you again, Rachel. Uh, our next fan email comes from Dave Doherty. Thank you, Dave. And he says, hi, team. Uh, what were your thoughts on McLaren's strategy in today's race? <laughs> Oh boy. Uh, was it spot on? Tire calls were good. Just, Tire calls were correct. The compounds were right. Perhaps just a hint of sarcasm. Going <laughs> on here. Um, also, I think Max absolutely embarrassed himself today uh, at lap one. He wasn't racing McLaren who had the pace. Um, well done on Lewis uh, on holding him up and shutting up Max. Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't even think there was, that was even so much of Lewis holding him up. I think it was Max uh, undoing himself. Um, yeah, we pretty much we pretty much already got that one covered too. That uh, that that was pretty clearly Max's fault, and that he somehow avoids punishment again. Uh, much to our, I wouldn't even say we're really surprised at this point, but I digress. Uh, the McLaren team strategy was almost fine. <laughs> Just think they should have done Oscar first. Yeah, it's it's one small little thing, and we're not we're not talking about any of this. It, it was it, you know like the reaction has been almost universal. It's just it's it's so to to coin one of my favorite poker movies when uh, the oh god the guy at. Uh, the end of rounders goes, it's so unsatisfying. That's kind of how I feel with this. It's a one, two, but I am so unsatisfied because of it. And it didn't need to happen. It was just so unnecessary. So, you know, again, just be who you are. Trust your guys, trust your data, trust each other. Um, You're going to probably come out a lot better and stop seeing ghosts. You know, don't, don't worry about what happened before what's happening now. You know, and, and maybe there's another race where, you know, you're a tenth or two off and maybe you have to do that cover off move. That's fine if that's the the race that presents itself. None of what that entire sequence presented itself that I thought that that was the right move to go. And I'm like, as soon as I saw that, as soon as I hear it, and 
unlike in Great Britain, there was no debate about this. Lando got a call to box when he was in like the last second to last corner. So there wasn't a discussion. It was not that. It was not, you know, committee this, committee that. They made a decision. It clearly wasn't the right one based on the conditions, but at least they made a decision. So I guess there's progress where we can find it. Me. <laughs> All right. Yeah. All right. Thank you again, uh, again, Dave. We are, you were definitely correct on that. Uh, the, the McLaren bashing was going to be the, uh, the primary point in these, um, because I, I was taking a quick scan through the, the next one that we got and, uh, yeah, it's all there. Uh, speaking of which our next fan email comes from the formula. Thank you, Mr. Formula. And they said, who knew that daytime soap operas are now on Sundays and aired live on ESPN and F1 TV. <laughs> Plenty of storylines here. This is a great way to put it. Uh, number one, McLaren better have a fire extinguisher handy. I think they have a fire to put out. Number two, Max has regressed in terms of his judgment and attitude a bit lately, but I don't want him to change at all. It's always excitement. Number three, even if Oscar won that race without the drama, I don't think he would have shown any more happiness or excitement than we saw. He's very subdued by default. Uh, it serves him well in pressure situations, but damn, man, act like you just got your first F1 win. I would have thought he got third by his reaction. And number four, one good Checo drive doesn't save him. He's gone 2025 or earlier. Red Bull may have a legit fight on their hands. They can't be missing Q1 and finishing on the back half of the points with one of their drivers. A couple to unpack here. I would not even say that this was a good Checo drive, or I guess you could say maybe by his recent output that it was a better drive. Um, I definitely, I think I've said it several times now, I definitely think he's gone by next year. Even with this contract extension, uh, apparently there are clauses in there that uh, can remove him from that seat if he doesn't meet uh, particular uh, performance standards, and he does not seem to be getting any closer to those. So, uh, you know, I'm, I don't know if I'm 100% on that he's going to be out of that seat after the summer break. Um, it definitely could change, though, if, if McLaren really, really makes a fight out of this. Um, as far as the, the Max has regressed in terms of his judgment and attitude a bit lately, yeah, like Andy said, he's he's feeling the desperation now. It is not nearly the smooth sailing that he's had for the last two seasons. He is now under pressure, and we saw Max under pressure in 2021 and what that looks like, and it gets messy sometimes. But I also agree that I don't really want him to change at all because Max has made it very clear in pretty much every interview that we've seen with him where they've asked him such questions that he does not care what other people think about him. He just wants to go out there and perform and race and win and whatever people think of him, whatever. And I do have a lot of respect for that. Uh, you know, we've got some drivers in formula one, like Lewis Hamilton, who are, uh, you know, show themselves to be, uh, representatives and kind of paragons of the sport, uh, where they, uh, they, you know, do their best to be a strong role model, and try to, you know, do the best they can for public perception and go out of their way to, uh, you know, do good and make a name for themselves outside of the world of Formula One. And I really respect that as well. You know, I think Lewis is uh, as good of a, a representative and spokesperson for Formula One as there is. But on the other side of that, I have a lot of respect for guys like Max and Fernando Alonso, who um, just... They, they don't care what anybody thinks. They're going to do as they're going to do. And they know that, you know, it's going to get messy sometimes. And some people aren't going to like the way that they do the things that they do, but that the history and record books will, you know, make them out as top drivers in the sport. And we've said it a lot of times that it takes a certain amount of ruthlessness to be a top performer in any sport. And I think uh, when we see Max acting like this, I think it's just that ruthlessness coming out. And the other, the thing I'll say about that, you know, 
both, I know Max Verstappen and Fernando Alonso both do have, I think, charitable foundations that they both support. Uh, I know. No, I, I didn't mean to sell them short on those kind of things oh. at all. I just meant that. It's, no, uh, I mean, I think it's just it, when the helmet goes down, it's it's a different it's a different mindset. It's a different mentality. I'm where where Lewis may try to say this is how you should do it. These guys go out and just do it, and they'll be nice and good citizens afterwards. So I mm-hmm. think that's the difference of the mindset. And I don't know that anyone is better than the other. I mean, there is an argument to be said. And it's, again, this this whole race kind of puts me into my own existential bind because in watching Lando go through this whole 20-lap melodrama that didn't have to happen, you know, I'm watching that and I'm going, you know, who are you and what do you want? and had Lando done it, I, I probably would have lost a lot of respect for that guy, knowing his background, knowing everything that he would have done. And I would have been here and thinking, well, the way you win matters. And yet we've got these other guys who just say, just win, baby. You know, and, and, and so it was putting me in a bind. And I'm glad Lando did what he did. He, 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 he ultimately, in my opinion, did the right thing. But it was so unnecessary. It's the to have right to get thing, there. but twenty-five points is twenty-five. Points. Oh no, I know. And, and and the argument of the championship is going to be there. And if this gets tighter, that argument is only going to get worse. And right now, the only thing that I think is saving McLaren's bacon is math, <laughs> because yeah. otherwise, they don't really have a whole lot of leg to stand on. Yep, I agree. Um, thank you, Mr. Formula, for your email. And our last one comes from John. Yes, that John again. Thank you very much, John, for, for emailing us. And John says, I've been saying it for years now, and I stand by it. Max's only move is aggression. Oh, boy, we're, we are definitely going to get spicy with this one. <laughs> um, all of 2021, he would dive bomb Lewis, knowing that Lewis would avoid the collision. Uh, or he would run anyone trying to pass him off the track by pulling a uh, Nico Rosberg, I forgot, to turn at the corner move. Um, championship two and three have been with a car that is 30 seconds ahead of the competition to the point that even Max was getting bored. Now he's got competition again, and the constant bitching, moaning, and overly aggressive driving is back. And these idiots call him the GOAT. SMH. Also, McLaren, what the actual... I'm going to insert a probably a fuck here, but it is actually uh, <laughs> That's a, what it is. a text. Leap. Yep. Uh, have they already just decided that pursuing Max for the driver's championship is less important than driver equality or whatever the hell this was today? F for your participation trophies. You screwed Lando from a points standpoint and poor Oscar's win just feels like meh. It's not like Oscar was breathing down his neck with better pace. Today felt like finally getting into the best restaurant in town, only for it to be rubbish. Probably the least satisfying one, too, I've seen for a very long time. Yep, I would say, uh, oh, just going cruising my memory banks here. Another probably very unsatisfying one, too, in a lot of people's eyes for similar reasons would be uh, that... uh, uh, what was, I don't remember what the radio tag that's really popular that went with it was, but uh, we're uh, Sebastian Vettel. Multi-21, uh, Seb. Multi-21. Yeah, there you go. The multi-21 goes past Mark Webber and and takes that win. I've seen a lot of Mark Webber gifts doing this. <laughs> this this does uh, kind of wax of that quite a bit um, now that I'm thinking about it. And I think we're probably going to look back on this one uh, in the future with uh, a very similar opinion, but I, I had a multi uh, eighty fourteen reference ready to go, but we never <laughs> got there. Very nice. Um, yeah, the yeah, I think John pretty much hit these uh, all very well. Now, uh, you know, I got to come back to this as as a Max fan. Um, Yes, he is uh, a, a big bitchy money guy sometimes. That said, I think at the end of his career, his numbers are going to put him amongst the goats. 
I don't know. Formula One is really a sport where you can have one true greatest of all time. Um, but I think at the end of his career, we're going to look back on Max and say he's definitely one of them. Um, love him or hate him. No, I think it, it, it's – I've always my, – my position on Max is love him, hate him, doesn't matter. You, you better damn well respect him um, because there is talent there. It is – and we talked about it earlier today. You know, I think there is a duality in that guy that you can have the cold collected, easy as you like, lovely drive guy, and you have this. And they are both one and the same. And the difference can be pressure. And it's going to be on Max. Now, The uh, like I said before, the only thing that is saving Max Verstappen's bacon right now also is math because he is still... 76 points up in the drivers after this, which means that he could go to Ibiza for Spa and forget about it, and Lando could win, and it still wouldn't exactly matter yet. And that's, like, I I get what John is saying about McLaren and why aren't you prioritizing the guy in the drivers? And is there a point in a championship where that has to be the case? Yes, yes. Do I think we are at that point based on where the math is? No. Um, Not to mention it had kind of been decided on track. Again, we'll never know if Oscar doesn't have the off and turn 11 there and it doesn't ever get close. Do we ever get to this point? We never know. But the point is, the corrective action is, you had the one, two. You didn't have to cover anybody else off. Give Oscar the preferred strategy. And none of this happens. That's where it comes back to for me. And, you know, the Max thing, I, I understand. I know what John's position on Max has been for a long time. Um, we've debated this subject a lot. And, and that's where I come back to where I say, you know, you, you don't have to like him, but you have to at least respect that there is talent there. There is also the whiny, crabby child, but there's a very talented, whiny, crabby child sometimes at the same time. And I do think that it is going to be fascinating to watch the dynamic. If Max continues to get under pressure and the car is not there, what happens? Can he evolve? Does he learn to do something that I know is not in his DNA? Damage limit. Damage limitation. That was a case where you could have come home in P3 or P4 and been fine. And instead, you decided to, you know, red mist it the entire thing. And it it did cost you. Uh, some points. Amazingly, it didn't cost you more. Amazingly, the stewards <laughs> didn't make it cost him more, which is, I, I don't agree with that either. But, you know, it probably should have, in retrospect, cost him more, but it didn't. And, you know, sometimes people just have a horseshoe up the rear end. What can I tell you? I don't really know what else to say about that. Horseshoe up the rear end, you know, dominant driver in the sport over the last few years it probably gives you some benefit of the doubt, even if it's not meant to. But yes, thank you. Thank you, John, for your email, John. uh, Probably not the biggest Max fan. Also, judging by the content, probably not a real big Nico Rosberg fan. (laughs) No, that one goes back. Both him and I have had many discussions (laughs) about that guy. Um, And ironically enough, who was there doing the commentary on Sky all weekend was uh, what Nico Rosberg. Uh, Anyway, he's back. He's back. He's still there. Uh, anyway, thank you again to everybody who chimed in. We hope we did this justice. Uh, my existential crisis has been resolved. So thank you for all helping me work all of that through. Um, so we will now turn into our awards. We will start with the rubbish. Cody, I'll let you go first here. What you got? I don't think I've done this before. My rubbish award is going to go to Max Verstappen. And as, as we've been stating here, I really respect Max Verstappen. I think he is one of the best the sport has seen probably since Lewis Hamilton came came into the sport. But, dude, you know, GP really hit the nail on the head when he called you childish this race. Yeah, I'd agree with that one. And mine is of a similar vein. Paging the stewards. Paging the stewards. There's an incident at turn one you may want to deal with. And for whatever reason, you didn't. And it just boggles my mind. And I can't think. I don't know what you guys were. You, they took two hours to decide. They probably did the thing where they went and had dinner. 
And maybe, you know, maybe they should make the decision when they're still hungry because maybe then they would have come with a right one. But we had to wait forever until, you know, I finally, well, I'll, I'll share my anecdote about what happens when I fall asleep in the world. But I happened to fall asleep and then I woke up and there were other things going on in the world at that time. And then I happened to see, I was trying to find the decision and I finally found the decision bot. And I'm like, really? No further action after that? And I was probably so out of it and so drained by this entire race that I'm like, fine, whatever. But the more I think about it, the more angry I get about it because like, come on, like that's causing a collision regardless of who it's against, whether it's Lewis, Lando or anybody else. It, it, the thing is what it is. And going off the track and gaining an advantage is not better either. So those two things need to get addressed and they're not. And that's wrong. Mm -hmm. Agreed. All right, uh, we will not spend a ton of time here because we've already done this, but analysis paralysis, it's very simple, pointing right at my head here. There's really only one candidate here. The MCL boys, whoever came up with the idea to stop Lando first on that second stop needs to not continue to do that. I've seen texts, I've tried to see Andrea Stella come out and defend it. I appreciate the effort. It's not going to work, bud. Um, stop Oscar first, and this is drama free. It might not be perfect, but at least it's drama free, and it lets the drivers decide it on track. Trust you guys. All of this I've said, and I'm done with it at this point. So, Cody, what you got? Uh, ditto, Claren. Why must you shoot yourself in the foot? You had this in the bag. You could have made it really, really fun and really, really satisfying, and it just. Like you said, you got to put your trust in your drivers. Yeah. Enough said there. All right, so we'll move on to our Dark Horse of the Day. I like the fact we've got some variety here. I'm going to go first with this one. I've got Yuki Tsunoda, uh, who seems to be my favorite Dark Horse this year. Uh, the guy in the not top five who manages to get in the points, and he likes to do it a lot. So uh, better for V-Carb here. I think both him and Danny Rick actually showed pretty decently here, so it's good to see V-Carb getting back on track. I was happy to see that Yuki Tsunoda continuing to put his name in there. Don't know that it's going to be for that second Red Bull seat, but maybe anything's possible. Yeah, I think Yuki Tsunoda is, is a really great choice this year. Just about any race for Dark Horse because he is sneaking into those ninth and tenths and, and getting points here and there. And the fact that he's done it so consistently uh, over this year, I think really shows that he is maturing as a driver and, it, it really disappoints me that it doesn't seem like he's even going to get a shot uh, at that Red Bull seat. Um, my Derek horse, however, this time is going to be Charles Leclerc. And that's because he's had so much bad luck lately that I, you know, have been thinking it might go on forever. And he got into that fourth place and we didn't really hear anything about it. Now there was, as we've discussed, a lot of other things going on in that race. So there wasn't really uh, too much time to talk about Leclerc sneaking up there, but, Got some really good points. I think uh, that's going to get some of the, the stress off his back uh, over how some recent races have gone. And uh, hopefully that means we uh, we see him back on the podium soon. Yeah, very good. All right. So our driver of the day, I think we have some consensus here. Uh, I will give it to the guy who won the race, who did deserve the win, who we should be celebrating. And I should... I feel so bad that I'm not celebrating more as a team guy. Oscar Piastri. Guy was on the sidelines two years ago. He's won a sprint race, and now he's won a Grand Prix. This is the start of what's going to be an amazing career. This, there's a reason he was so sought after. There's a reason. We're coming up on the two-year anniversary of the tweet turn around the world, by the way. And there's a reason that that reverberated as much as it did. Because he is probably one of the next of the next generations that's coming in. So it looks like it's going to be something really good if the team around him can just get it right. But Oscar, you deserved it. Well done. I mean, after FP2, he, he was on it all weekend. So uh, I am proud, sir. Oscar Piastri, well-deserved driver of the day for me. Cody, what you got? Yep. I agree. Driver of the day, Oscar Piastri. Congratulations on your first Grand Prix victory in Formula One. Uh, he deserved it. Um, I really like Oscar Piastri for his, his dry sense of humor and subdued temperament. Uh, it really cracks me up a lot of the time. And, and man, he is 
really good behind the wheel. Uh, you know, managed to, to get his first win and only his second season. And uh, but first, first Grand Prix win, got his first sprint win in his first season. So we know the talent is there. And even though it got a little ugly this time, you do have to remember that he got the win and uh, he deserved it. I, I don't know if you've seen it, but he had some absolute on qualifying day. He had some golden radio when uh, Tom Stallard was coming on the radio and trying to give him the who was behind him. And he said this was after Sonoda had just wrecked and brought out the red flag. And he goes, that's Sonoda behind you, followed by whoever else was behind him. And Oscar comes on the radio and goes, uh, yeah, I don't think that's Sonoda behind me because he's kind of um, missing a couple wheels. And I think that's probably the other V-carb. And Tom Stallard goes, <laughs> yep, thanks for correcting me there. <laughs> and it was just a moment I like I thought of you in that and I'm like that's your humor that's Oscar's humor you guys are like on the same wavelength it's kind of freaky that way indeed all right well as we said before the predictions game didn't happen because of the nasty weather through here uh, we will get back at it uh, next time for spa and I'll also try to give a recap of where we are as we head into the summer break. I will get the spreadsheet out. I will get all the previews out. And I will tally up the scores and update everybody as to where we are. I think we're actually closer than I think. I think you're winning, but I think it's closer than I think. But as, as we said, we've got one more ride on this F1 emotional roller coaster. And we're going to go to the roller most roller coaster-ish of a track that is out there. Spa and the Belgian Grand Prix await. I am excited. Uh, we were talking a little bit in one of the breaks, like, do we like this before or after the break? I would prefer it after the break because that was always my, we're back to F1 and let's do it at this iconic ass track and nothing against uh, Zandvoort. Zandvoort can be iconic in its own way, especially if it rains like it did last year. But uh, I, I think I would still, if I was the calendar chieftain of the world, I would find a way to get Spa back in its traditional spot if I could. But anyway, I'm always happy to be here. I'm glad this thing is still on the calendar. May long, may that continue. Uh, and we're going to get all excited for it. So, Cody, any final thoughts? Uh, same thing as you. I kind of preferred Spa being the first race back after the break just because, uh, you know, we've been away for like four weeks and then you come back for Spa. Everybody likes Spa. And I think I've said this for uh, leading into a lot of tracks this year that, oh, this is one of my favorite tracks. Well, Spa is my favorite track. Uh, and, and you know, all the, the racing simulator games that I've played, it's, it's one of my favorite tracks to drive on out of anything, even tracks outside of Formula One. So this one's going to be good. There's been a lot of fantastic, uh, memorable races here in the past. Uh, I just hope uh, it doesn't rain too hard so we don't get the uh, least <laughs> iconic race of all time again yeah let's not but, do that uh, some some tells me it's it's going to be a good one i am hopeful as well. well we'll get in all that we will look at what the weather is going to do we will be back uh with our hopefully our normal preview timing uh and we'll try to get that out uh last plug go listen to our giles richards interview it is worth the time if you've made it all the way to here Thank you so much for listening to all of our ranting and ravings about this race. But go listen to that. It's actually a lot tighter than all of this. But we'll be back later on this week. We'll preview Spa. We'll get into all that. This is an emotional roller coaster, but I'm glad I'm riding on it. And Cody, I'm glad I'm riding on it with you, bud. So uh, we'll be back next week. And until then, may all your laps be fast. Thank you for listening to today's episode of the Outlap F1 podcast. If you like what you heard, click that subscribe button and be sure to leave us a five-star review. If you want to connect with us outside of the show, check out our website at www.outlapf1.com. Find us on Twitter and Instagram at Outlap F1 podcast or email us at chat now at outlapf1.com. As always, thank you so much for your support and we'll see you on the next one.